Um, the guest speaker tonight, and, and tonight's very different in, in some ways because we have two guest speakers. One is uh, Susan Mara Bregman. Susan gave us a lecture a while back, uh, I want to say a year and a half ago, on uh, neon signs. And it was well received and it was uh, a lot of fun. Well, she's written another book. And, and this one is uh, all about New England candle pin bowling, as the title uh, indicates. Um, she is a Boston resident. And I learned today, and I don't know, I'm not going to try and be too, give out too much information, but she's written a new book. And that I'll let her tell you about if she so deems it towards the, um, towards her presentation. But uh, she began photographing old neon signs in the Boston area in 2012 and put together a presentation that she gave to us. Um, she loves neon signs and candle pin bowling. Who can, who can fault that? Um, so without any more of my messiness here, I'd like to introduce you to Susan Mara Bregman. Um, okay. Well, thank you. My name is Susan Bregman. Um, so yes, I'm a writer, I'm a photographer, and my day job is transportation consultant. So I like trains and buses also. Um, some of you may remember my presentation on New England Neon, which was, I think, probably two years ago at this point. And I got to meet people in person and today, you know, we're Zooming, so what can I say? But I'm here to talk about candle pin bowling today. So I want to start by reading a little bit from the book. I grew up in New York, where 10 pin rules. I discovered candle pins when I moved to Boston after college. I wish I could say it was love at first sight, but that was not the case. I played a game here or there, but for most of my adult life, I was oblivious to bowling in any of its variations. But one night I got together with a couple of old friends and we decided to go bowling. Once I laced up that pair of rental shoes, picked up one of those small balls, I was hooked. Much to my chagrin, I was not a good bowler. Okay, fine, I was a terrible bowler. Even when I tried to sneak in a few extra balls by not pressing the reset button, I could barely knock down any pins, but that's the beauty of candle pin bowling. There is always room for improvement. So let me start with a quick overview of candle pin. I'm sure everyone here knows everything about candle pin, but I'll do it anyway, just for the record. The game uses tall skinny pins. They're called candle pins because they kind of sort of resemble candles. They're 15 and three quarter inches high and they are identical top and bottom, so they're, um, you, there's no up, no down. The balls are smaller than 10 pin balls. They're about two and a half pounds, and they have no finger holes. They, they fit in your hand. They're about the size of a grapefruit. And players have three rolls per frame, and this is one of the key differences. And the pins are not cleared between the balls. This means you can use the fallen pins called the wood to try to knock down the pins that are still standing, but it's not as easy as it sounds, unfortunately. Um, the game is currently played almost exclusively in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, and the Canadian Maritimes. There's a couple of outposts in the Midwest, but it's basically a New England and North Route One game, pretty much. Um, but candle pins were invented in Worcester. In the 1880s, um, Justin White, known as Pop White, this distinguished gentleman with his beard here, um, he owned a billiards hall in Worcester and he was looking for another way to entertain his customers. Supposedly, he found some dowels or broomsticks or some skinny wooden round things in, the, in a closet somewhere. And he said, why don't we try making this into a bowling game? but it didn't work. They were too hard to knock down. They were just too skinny. So he went back to the drawing board. While he was noodling around with all this, an itinerant pool player named Jack Monsey, John Monsey, entered the picture. He was demonstrating his pool prowess and White hired him on the spot. And together, the magic combination of White and Muncie created the game that we now know today as candle pin bowling. So candle pins are one of four types of small ball bowling in the US and Canada, and the others being duck pins, 
rubber band duck pins and five pin and five pin is a Canadian game. So candle pin bowling became standardized the rules in the early 1900s around 1906 and once the game was standardized teams and leagues could quickly spring up. And they had these crazy turn of the century names like the Daffodils and the Speed Boys and the Skidoos. These guys over here, they're the Cardinals. And newspapers covered bowling tournaments all the time and they did it with breathless enthusiasm. Bowling leagues thrived from the earliest days of the game but they really hit their stride in the 50s through the 80s and they provided a reliable source of income for candle pin houses. Leagues were usually sponsored by factories, by businesses, by religious institutions, and social organizations. These are a couple of leagues in Worcester. One is from a bunch of restaurant workers, one is from a bunch of insurance employees, and I'll let you figure out which one's which. Until the 50s, the 1950s, pins were set by hand. And in the earliest days of the game, young boys, maybe 10 or 11 years old, served as pin setters or they were known as pin boys. This photo here is from Lewis Hine and it was part of his documentation of child labor at the beginning of the 20th century. And eventually these young guys got banned from setting pins, but the game still needed manual pin setters, they were just a little bit older. Bullmore, a company that's based in Littleton, Massachusetts, Bullmore introduced automated candle pin setters and they introduced them at Whalem Park and Bullmore dominated the candle pin industry into the 1960s when they went out of business. But today, many of those Bullmore machines that were installed in the 50s and 60s are still running, although some of them need a little bit of, you know, duct tape. Um, and this pin setter here on the right, that is not a Bullmore, but it is an active pin setter at Boston Bowl in Dorchester. Before ball returns were invented in the 1930s, pin boys had another responsibility. They had to return the ball to the bowlers. And they did this by rolling them down a ramp and then gravity and momentum did the rest. The earliest automated pin setters like these in the lower right, um, you could see they had visible tracks and they were pretty streamlined. They had that sort of 1930s, 1940s stylishness to them. Um, later models like these here at um, Park Place in New Hampshire, Park Place Lanes, put the track under the um, approach area. So it had a more, um, a cleaner, cleaner look, but you know, they basically worked the same. It was still gravity, it's still momentum. The real mechanics were getting the ball from the pit, you know, where it ends up after you roll it to the top of the ramp. And then again, it just rolls back if you set it up correctly. Oh, I should say this is, um, this is Wakefield Bolodrome up here, this streamlined one. Scorekeeping has also evolved over the years from paper and pencil, which is still my favorite. And these days, a lot of candle pin houses have begun to introduce high-tech systems that calculate pinfall. They can tell you how fast the ball is going and they automatically reset the pins. These are probably my favorite type of scoring machines. These are known as the telescores and they didn't have a really long life and they're really hard to find today but they have that mid-century Jetsons look. And um, basically, you, they're still manual machines. You use a wax pen pencil, you write your score on a clear sheet of, I don't know, plastic acetate something, and then it's projected onto a screen, just like an overhead projector. And they're like, very, very cool. These telescores are at Bolo's Cantina and Kitchen, or Kitchen and Cantina in Brunswick, Maine. And that place used to be known as the Bowling Bowl. And that's where Angus King bowls, the Senator from Maine. Here's another shot of Bolos. And this is the all important reset button where you press this after your three balls or fewer if you hit a strike or a spare and um, get ready for the next frame. 
So many people associate cattle pin polling, cattle pin bowling with Channel 5, and Don Gillis was responsible for that. Don Gillis hosted Candle Pin Bowling for most of its 38 year run. And Candle Pin Bowling helped encourage um, a renaissance in bowling in the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and one of the reasons, and this, um, I had a chance to talk with Mike Morin, he wrote the foreword to my book, but he wrote his own book about the television era. And his theory is that bowlers on these shows were really everyday people, but they had one extraordinary skill and television made them celebrities and people wanted to emulate them. And here you see um, Don Gillis in the center, a very young Ed Harding on the left from Channel 5, and they're giving a trophy to Tommy Olsta, who was a champion bowler. He um, had a 22, 22 week run on candlepin bowling. And candlepin bowling on Channel 5, it spawned a whole bunch of imitators. Brian Leary here also of Channel 5. He had his own show here. He's um, congratulating Joe Tavernese. And another one, <coughs> excuse me, was candlepins for cash. And I think a lot of people remember that name. And that was on WNAC, which I think was Channel 7. And what distinguished that show was it had pin pals, meaning people could send in postcards and hope that their postcard would be picked and then they would share prizes with the bowlers who were on TV. So that had audience participation. So let me talk a little bit about some of the people and places in the game. First, you cannot talk about candle pin bowling without talking about Stacia Zernicke. Stacia Zernicke was widely considered the best female bowler around. And some say she was just the best candle pin bowler, period. She was a world champion eight times, a Massachusetts state champion 12 times, and she logged 55 appearances on the candle pin bowling TV show. And just as cool, she has a stretch of road named for her in her native Webster, Massachusetts. These are the three oldest candle pin houses in Massachusetts. Top right is Putnam Street Lanes in Fitchburg. That's the oldest. I've not ever been able quite to figure out the date, but it's pretty close to 1900. It's on the second floor of a building just off Main Street in downtown Fitchburg. And Fitchburg actually, until very recently, had two candle pin alleys. The building on the left is Shelburne Falls Bowling Alley in Shelburne Falls. And that's behind Main Street in a little, as you can see, in a little house. And finally, in the lower right, that's Needham Bowlaway. And Needham Bowlaway is in downtown Needham, eight lanes in a basement. And um, it dates from 1917. And it's the oldest cattle center in Metro Boston. Brighton Bowl is one of the newest candle pin alleys around. Um, this is part of a flatbread restaurant. It's over by WGBH in Brighton. It's the place where I discovered my love of candle pin bowling. That's where I went with my friends. And it's been closed throughout the pandemic, but there are signs that it might be reopening soon. So I'm hopeful. This is Central Park Lanes in East Boston. And what I like about this are the old school ball returns. Again, this really streamlined design, which dates this place probably back to the 40s. These are a couple of my favorite spots in Maine. On the left is Bolarama in Sanford. On the right is Big 20 in Scarborough. And Big 20 has this cool thing. Big 20 was originally called State of Maine, but that didn't last very long. But the really interesting thing was that they offered duck pins, candle pins, and 10 pins when it opened in 1950. The bowling center eventually converted to an all candle pin house late in the 50s 
when they had to pick one for automation because they didn't want to invest in technology for all three types of bowling. So now it's a 20 lane cattle pin house. This is Brian's Bowl Away in Gardner, Mass. Um, Brian Favreau bought the place in the 80s, but it probably dates from the 30s. It's 14 lanes. And this is another one of my favorite spots. This is Sawyer's Bolodrome. Sawyer's is just six lanes, and it's in a basement in Northborough, Massachusetts. Ernie Sawyer Jr. opened the place with his father, Ernie Sr., in 1953. And Ernie Jr. still runs the place with his kids. Now, you know I like neon signs, so I also like bowling alley signs. Um, and here are some of my favorites. Um, top left, I guess I'll go clockwise from top left, is Wakefield Bolodrome, a very nice 1950s era design. Then in the middle is Woburn Bolodrome, which has amazing, amazing typography and this really irritating light pole in the center. Lita Lanes in Nashua, New Hampshire has some nice neon going on and Sunnyside Bowl has a very lovely roof mounted neon sign with a flashing arrow. So very cool signs. And Brighton Bowl actually commissioned a brand new neon sign. You can see it's a candle pin back there behind the letters. Um, they commissioned a brand new sign for their for their candle pit house to welcome customers. This is Cape Ann Lanes in Gloucester, and they have a stunning sign. Um, and they're one of the candle pit houses out there that are trying to reinvent the game right now. The owners are Caitlin and Nick Zenny, and they had their wedding reception there in 2016. And a few months later, they teamed up with Nick's uncle and they bought the place. And what they're doing is they're, they're trying to expand the, enter, you know, make, make Candlepin attract a wider audience. They host a lot of events. They have a lot of community connections um, and they, they have a lot of kids events. And they also have a, a pub and brewery at the bowling alley. So they're trying to do a lot of things to bring the game into the 21st century. Other cattlemen houses doing that have also introduced food and liquor, and they include Sacco's in Somerville, which is another, another flatbread house. It used to be Sacco's Bowl Haven. Um, Ron's Ice Cream in Hyde Park. And um, Bolarama in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The current owners, Bolarama originally opened in 1956. But the current owners, the Medarios, uh, Andrew Medarios and his parents, bought out the place a few years ago and began to make modern improvements. And today, Bolarama has state-of-the-art scoring, cushy seating, food, booze, and cosmic bowling, which you can see here. And cosmic bowling, for the uninitiated, is basically disco lights, and laser lights and rock music, and it's designed to elevate the bowling experience and make it more entertaining. And again, can't talk about candle pins without talking about Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth loved all kinds of bowling. He liked 10 pin, he liked duck pin, he liked candle pin. And we don't really know what he's doing here. It, it's probably candle pin, it could be duck pin, we'll probably never know, but we know Babe Ruth was a small ball bowler, so we like to think he was a candle pin guy. This picture's from 1930. And here, of course, is Wallex. Wallex opened in 1947, and it was eventually a massive entertainment complex, as you all know. In addition to candle pin bowling, the center offered roller skating, miniature golf, billiards, and video games. Some of the lanes ended up at Needham Bowlaway. I just learned tonight some of the pins ended up with you. And um, some other artifacts have also ended up with the city, and I know the mayor is going to talk about that, so I won't steal her thunder. These are the new lanes that were built in Waltham in the rec center. I'm sure there's a better word for that building. Um, four lanes, four candle pin lanes. 
And there is also a mural you can see here. This is a mural on the right showing what Wallex used to look like. So very cool, very cool feature. This is Turnpike Bolodrome, also known as Lanes and Games. This was on Route 2 in Cambridge. And one of the really interesting things about this place is Jim Rice, Red Sox Jim Rice, used to bowl here. Jim Rice is a big time candle pin bowler, and this was said to be his favorite spot. He even filmed a promo here for the Massachusetts Bowling Association. And one of the fun things that Mike Morin tells in his book is that even though the PSA featured Rice, Tommy Olsta was the guy who did the actual bowling. Couple more lost places with neon signs. The uh, Malden Bowlerdrome here on the left, that's a neon, neon bowling pin up top from the side. And Bola Mat in Beverly, I have a pin from there. Um, again, awesome sign. I love that bowling pin in the center, bowling ball in the center. And I started this presentation talking about Worcester and that's where I wanna end it. This is Colonial Bowl in Worcester. It was the last Candlepin House standing in Worcester until about a year ago. I bowled there just before Massachusetts locked down for the pandemic. I think I was there on March 12th, 2020. And Colonial closed for good a few months later. It had opened in 1960, so it had a good run. It had a 20 year, 60 year run. Um, and it, it was a time capsule. I mean, you look at this, it, it looked when it closed pretty much the way it looked when it opened. And it changed so little over those 60 years that it even had a rotary dial telephone until a couple of years before it closed. So let me just wrap up with a few more words from my book. I have bowled bad games to be sure, but I've never had a bad experience in a candle pin house. It's true that as of this writing, I have not rolled a strike. And that's actually not true anymore, I just want to say. Um, but as I wrote earlier, that is the beauty of candle pin bowling. There is always room for hope. So here's my contact info, and I'm going to turn it back to Wayne. Thank hey. you. Thank you, Susan. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I think that um, you've you've done as great a job with this as you did with the neon. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I think that that's wonderful. Um, one of the things that we're going to do next is uh, let's see. I can still see your screen, but we're going to um, move next to continue the show. Not that it's over, but um, when we first heard that. Um, Susan was going to do a, uh, a presentation on candle pin bowling. She immediately asked about someone familiar with the Wallex and there was no one whose name came to mind more quickly than Mayor McCarthy. Um, I reached out to her and without even hesitating, she indicated that she was more than pleased to um, uh, help us out. So what we did was, um, she took some time out of her schedule. We went up to the chill zone and we did a, a filming. Um, I say film. I know it's not film. I know it's digital somehow. But the, the, the bottom line is what we think we'll do now is we'll play that for you. Uh, if Susan, let's see. Oh, I have to unshare. I'm sorry. Um, stop share. Okay. <laughs> and so now in order to share the screen, um, I don't know, Mayor McCarthy, whether you want to say anything to, uh, by way of uh, introduction or whether you want me to play it and talk after. It's up to you, ma'am. I'm fine with playing the video. Okie doke. Okay. All right, we'll get that underway right now. I'm going to do this and then I have to go here and I have to go there and I have to go share. And then I go to this and play. Everyone seeing that? Yes. Yes. Good morning. 
My name is Jeanette McCarthy. I'm the mayor of the city of Waltham. I would like to welcome you to the Waltham Community and Cultural Center in Waltham on Moody Street. And we're down in the uh, bowling area of the um, skating school and uh, chill zone. And this bench that I'm sitting on was Fred Tortola Jr.'s bench that was donated by the family. And Lou Giovanetti donated it to the city of Waltham. Now, I'd like to welcome you into the bowling alley area. Many of us have fond memories of the Wallachs. If you mention the Wallachs to anyone, it means fun. And Donna Laswell did a wonderful job creating the masking boards over here. The W with the candle pins indicates the city of Waltham. But as you know, this was shop areas for junior high school. So with the help of the city of Waltham's maintenance departments and some of my friends and Donnie Cassano, and um, the wires department, we basically transformed it into a mini bowling alley. Um, these are the pictures that show the before and after. Bowling it, nowadays is electronic. In the old days, they actually used to set the pins. So the Rando family and the Russo family and the Tortola family, they originally started the bowling alleys and the lanes over on Lexington Street. And they used to have a 99 cent special that for 99 cents you could bowl, roller skate, miniature golf, and have a hot dog and a soda as well. So it was a lot of fun for a lot of kids, but it was a savior. And it was opened for many years and then they closed it. I'm happy to say that when this center opened over here, two members of the original members of the family that started the bowling alleys in the recreation center were here to help us dedicate it. So if you come in, you'll see a picture of what the Wallachs was, 60 lanes they had. So this is pretty much what it looked like. And if you actually come from this side, this is also a Wallachs bench. This is not Wallachs. The alley itself comes from Milford, and we put it out to bid years ago to make four lanes. It's a little shorter than the normal lanes, but because we wanted to be able to fit it here and not have the whole uh, noise because candle pin bowling can be very noisy as you know to have it uh, go through the whole building so this is um, right now it's being used as a school for the dual language school but it, it's run by the recreation department and this building is as the chill zone which is an award-winning state program for um, outreach for kids so on Friday nights and Saturday they can come here and enjoy all kinds of activities here and and for free so it's um, thankful to the Recreation Department for all they do. Mayor, can you talk a little bit about when you were a lead bowler on Saturday mornings and maybe what your high score was, anything like that? <laughs> in those days, I was just bowling for fun. I really wasn't in any competition. But on Saturday morning, I was in the girls' league. So when the Wallace was closing, I was able to go and get a picture of the little girls' bowling league. So I have that in my office. But um, we used to go on Saturday mornings, and there are pitches in the skating school area, which is the roller skating area. And you can use a little bit of the old, a little bit of new, so you can use your scooters or you can roller skate or rollerblades. But in those days, they just had uh, candle pen bowling, and they also had the miniature golf and the uh, roller rink. So we went there, and if we were lucky, we got 99 cents, we got a dollar. So the dollar meant we had a lot of fun all day. But on Saturday mornings, we would go to the Candle Pen League. And originally, we started in the back, the annex, which was right next to Hardy School. And then once in a while, we'd be able to go to the big lanes. But there was a lot of adults activity. But in the mornings on Saturday, it was for the kids. And we had a lot of fun. Uh, I wasn't a real good bowler, but I just loved to bowl. And I loved to play miniature golf. And roller skating, I learned how to do. But that was a little more challenging. But, but there's very fond memories of candle pin bowling. We remember um, Channel 5 used to have, uh, at the Wallachs, they used to have their um, Saturday morning show over there. A couple of times we went over to see that. And it, I just can't say enough about the, um, the Rando family as well as Mr. Tortola. Uh, when I was a little girl, we couldn't afford the um, shoes. So we could go in our socks. But every once in a while, Mr. Tortola would say, what will be today, you know? And I, you know, we tell him how many strings we wanted. And said, any shoes? And we said, no. And so I'll never forget because he used to put up for the kids. And he said, you pay me back later, you know, have the shoes. So he was a very generous guy. 
and uh, his family and all of his sisters. And, you know, I can't say enough for what the, they did. And, you know, the second generation was also here to celebrate. But the Wallachs was, you know, a tremendous asset to a lot of children. Kept them out of trouble, kept them busy, and most importantly, kept them happy and fit. So, but we're happy to have this little memory of, of it here. Well, oh, thank you very much. I, I really want to um, thank the mayor for reaching out and letting us uh, go in and visit that place. Um, I, as you noticed, Sue Bregman was there that day as well. And, um, it was it was nice. She had a nice uh, addition to it. Um, we have some other photos that I could share or, or images that we can share, but we can, why don't we get right into the conversation if it gets, uh, if it gets like we need some more distraction, I'll throw some pictures up on the screen and share them for you. How's that? Um, Mayor McCarthy, do you want to uh, jump in and add anything? I just want to say how many actually had the pleasure of going to the Wallachs. That's all. Do you yeah. want to unmute Rachel, unmute people and just <laughs> ask people to speak one at a time if possible, but open anybody, it up to people. Yeah, anybody who would like to speak, you'll have to unmute yourself. If you go down to your the bottom of your screen, you should see the mute unmute option. And I definitely spent every Saturday of my elementary and middle school years at the Wallachs. Great memories there myself. I mean, I want to chime in and just say how wonderful it, it was for me. And I think in thinking about it in, in retrospect, I don't think we appreciated, you know, what a remarkable facility it was. Um, and how much fun it was. And I think as the mayor and Wayne said, I mean, all your friends were there. Um, it was just, uh, it was just terrific. Um, unfortunately, I never did learn how to roller skate backwards. And, and, you know, the cool kids could all, they could all do that. And particularly the most attractive girls were absolutely superb at roller skating backwards tremendously fast and showing us uh, poor boys all up. But uh, Mayor, I mean, you practically brought tears to my eyes. What a lovely, uh, what a lovely reminiscence you, you gave in that film. And, and I didn't know the families, but, but you really bring it back to us that uh, the families who are involved in the Wallachs really do deserve a great deal of thanks from all of us. Yeah, here. I have a, a question that uh, I remember. So uh, I went to Lexington Street Junior High and once a week um, after school, we would all, we would walk over there um, and go bowling. Um, and what I do remember is having to put on special shoes that you could rent or get um, at the Wallex. Um, so that would, I'm sure public health laws uh, would not allow uh, people to reuse shoes like that, but we did. And so I wondered, you know, what the thing with the shoes were, you know, why couldn't we just wear sneakers? Well, I can, I can give you a quick answer on that, Marie. When we were filming that, the mayor offered me the opportunity to bowl a, a, a frame and I had sneakers on. They don't slide real well on that wood. So oh. you, 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 could, you could end up um, coming to a quick stop sooner than you expected. Okay. So yeah, the also, idea was to slide as you were uh, bowling the- uh, Yes. Yeah. And I can say we rented bowling shoes into the 90s. My yeah. memory and beyond at other bowling alleys. So the shoe rental, I think, is probably still a thing. Maybe Susan can can let yeah, us. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Um, it, it Wayne, Wayne is right. The they're slippery, and it's so you can slide if you have proper form. Um, and and professional bowlers, there's only a slide on 
one foot and the other foot has like a rubber thing that lets you stop so that you can stop at the foul line so you don't slide all the way down. But it's also to protect the floors. They don't want outside shoes on the approach. Um, but yeah, um, I was renting bowling shoes into 2020. Um, you know, they have that magic spray that they use in between bowlers that supposedly kills everything. Um, it depends how skeevy you are, you know? Um, but bowling alley and, and real professional bowlers and high level bowlers own their own shoes for this reason. But it's a really good source of income for bowling alleys because, you know, what do they do? They pay like $25, $30 for a pair of shoes and then they rent it out over and over and over again for, you know, three bucks and they make their money back really fast and then it's just revenue for them. So it, it, it's, it's income for the bowling alleys as well. But it's, it's part of the tradition, house shoes. <laughs> Yeah, I remember certain times, you know, later years when a bunch of friends would get together and say, oh, we're going to go bowling. And if one of us girls had sandals or something on, you'd say, oh, I forgot my socks. You know, I, and you, yeah, you want to wear the, socks. <laughs> some of the lanes you could get a pair of socks behind the counter if you needed them. <laughs> now, if I if I share my screen, we can continue conversation. Is that correct, Rachel? Yeah, because, because what I'm thinking of is if I do a share, we have some images from the society that I might be able to pop up that will give us a little bit of um, um, a sense, I guess, of what Waltham's history is with it. Uh, the, the Charles River Billiard and Bowling Saloon, uh, they had cards, the trade cards that they would um, have printed up to advertise for themselves. Some of them were very pretty. Some of them were, were very interesting. It's the Billiard and Bowling Saloon and Oyster Room, uh, Moody Street near the bridge. On one side of the card would be this image, and, and I don't know what this one has to do with bowling, but maybe oysters. Um, another, uh, on the back, it would give you the information about the place, four tables, um, three alleys, bathrooms, oyster rooms. Uh, some of the information that we have in the society's collection um, runs the gamut in terms of the various um, establishments in the city. Uh, one of the images that we go back to, this is in amongst our watch factory collection. And it's labeled the Riverside Bowling. And I'm not 100% sure whether it's the Riverside Bowling Alley, which would be right near the river, or whether it was part of the, um, the watch factory. My suspicion is it's the uh, Riverside Bowling Alley on Moody Street. Anybody know more than that? Okay. And I, I think um, that's right. I think it was part of the the Riverside Club, if I'm if I'm right. Okay. Well, I've you heard probably... also there was a bowling alley on off of Felton Street. I think it was on Sun Street um, that one of the families. And they're still around. Uh, they they met. You know, people that grew up in the Felton Street area remember it. Right. We went looking to try and find any images uh, that we could of that. We wanted to try and have uh, some of the, the, the more rare images. Now, this picture was donated to the Historical Society by um, Alfred Hebert. I don't know if any of you remember him, but he was the uh, traffic cop in the, uh, in the roller skating rink. He would be the one who comes around and gives you a hard time if you were going too fast or skating mm -hmm. backwards. Or, um, but he he um, when he went into the hospital, he left this image and um, one other that I'll show you uh, that were were pretty interesting when you think about what's there now, how much things have changed. Uh, here's an, another one that's um, maybe a little familiar to folks. And remember those days, the fold up chairs and all the lanes, travel down memory lane here. Another one that we took at the chill zone, um, 
the chill zone is really a cool place that uh, you really should try and get up and, and take, take advantage of um, what's there. Uh, the, the city and the mayor has worked really, really hard to make this thing um, uh, a great place for young people to go. Uh, beyond just the, the bowling, they have 21st century bowling as well, and they've got a roller skating rink. We're hoping that um, in the not too distant future, we'll do a lecture on the chill zone itself, um, where we can show you more than what we were able to show you tonight. Um, here's a, a, a score sheet from the day. I'm sure that uh, most of you, if you don't remember how to fill it out, it probably looks, at least looks familiar. Um, oh, and the mechanisms that uh, Susan talked about, these are the mechanisms that are operating the lanes that are there right now. Um, it's, it's beyond my understanding. I'd have to look at it much more closely to understand it. All I know is I don't want to get my fingers caught in any of that. Uh, oh, the, um, the mayor mentioned the sign, the Little Girls Bowling League. Um, and there's one of our, one of our pins. If uh, not to sound too much like a salesperson, but if you're interested in the a pin to hang on your mantle, uh, we have a few. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, some of the coins that were available. Uh, again, from the collection of the Historical Society. I even think we have a pair of um, roller skating shoes uh, or roller skates because they are shoes. Um, but since this is about bowling, we'll sort of skip that. And here's a, a family special sign that we have. The society's got some information, some items from both the alleys and the roller skating rink and the miniature golf course. Uh, one more here is a summer special. You could do special bowling, roller skating, and golf. Uh, make it make a day of it. Would be it would be wonderful. Uh, the last one I'm going to put up is a QR code. This QR code will take you to um, our YouTube site. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, our lectures are being recorded. Uh, we will edit out the parts that I stumble and then we'll post them on YouTube for folks to uh, enjoy again. And uh, I, I want to thank both Susan Brigman and Mayor McCarthy for uh, their their contribution to tonight's show. Uh, if you have more questions, by all means, keep going. Um, I think Rachel and I will be willing to stay as long as uh, you have conversation. Yeah, I was I was going to throw in my my grandmother was such a bowler in the eighties and even in the early nineties that she had her own bowling ball and shoes and she had a special little bag set that that the bowling ball was in its own bag and she had another matching bag with the shoes and pockets and things she had her whole snazzy bowling set there <laughs> and she spent a lot of time bowling and I went with her a lot of times too we had birthday parties at the Wallex I mean I went bowling in other alleys and local places you know later years after the Wallex closed but I was going to ask Susan, I've never heard of duck pin. Could you tell us what duck pin bowling is? Sure, I could even show you a duck pin. I've, I've never heard of that. I've heard of candle pin and ten pin. So but I'm, duck pin, here, wait. <laughs> you need to go to Connecticut, I think. <laughs> yeah, oh, really? Do. So duck pin is another, as I said, there's four types of small ball bowling. Small ball meaning... You know, the balls are about two, between two and three pounds. Um, duck pin, here's a duck pin. Oh. So okay. they're like baby, baby 10 pins. They're a little fatter, they're a little shorter, they're very cute. Um, duck pins were supposedly invented in Baltimore. Around the same time, around turn of the century, late 1800s. Although there's some indication, maybe they were invented in Lowell, it's unclear. But these days, it's a Middle Atlantic game and a Southern New England game. So Maryland, Pennsylvania, parts of Virginia, District of Columbia, 
and also here, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. Um, duck pins are like candle pins in the sense that the balls are small. They're a little bit bigger than candle pin balls. And you also have three balls per frame. However, in duck pins, the, the fallen pins are cleared. So you're not playing any wood with duck pins. But it, it's very similar. So it's sort of like a cross between 10 pin bowling and, and candle pin bowling in some ways. And then there's a variation called rubber, rubber band duck pin where a thick rubber ring is attached around the, the, the fat part of the pin. And that was invented in Pittsburgh, but now it's only played in Quebec. <laughs> and it has a French name. So um, it's very strange. They're all very regional. All these bowling variations are very regional. And as I said, candle pins is primarily Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. But there is an alley in Ohio, and there's one in Chicago that I know about. And there might be one or two in upstate New York. But I have a question for, for you guys. Um, it's been my experience, at least in Worcester, that some of these big mansions, there's like a private candle pin lane in the basement. Have you encountered that? in Waltham at all? Because that would be very cool. <laughs> yeah, it would be cool. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any here. I, I think I ran into one in Connecticut, but mm -hmm. not in Waltham. That's where I rolled my strike in one of these in, um, in Worcester in a basement of a building that was being renovated. Um, it wasn't regulation length, so I, the strike is with an asterisk, but still. <laughs> There was a, an alley in Waverly Square that had a, a, a few, just a few lanes, and it was the equivalent almost of being in someone's basement. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like the Wallex was this huge, big place that you knew it, was, it meant business. This uh, in Waverly Square was almost like um, a hidden away basement of someone's house. But yeah, a lot of them were. No, not only that, but the lanes were warped. Um, so <laughs> oh, it made yeah. it pretty difficult to bowl if you have warped lanes. Yeah, it was yeah. under, there was an old cobbler shop in the same place. Uh, so did I hear that there were bowling lanes in like the basement of the White House? I think Richard Nixon installed them. Yeah. I don't yes. know if they're still there. It seems like those things come and go. Yeah, I've I seen can... pictures. I've seen pictures of Nixon bowling at, at yeah. that in those lanes. But they weren't candle pit lanes. No. <laughs> Probably not. No, I remember being shocked growing up here when we went on vacation, like to visit my grandfather and would go bowling as a kid. I was shocked to see that it wasn't candle pin because that's all I knew. And I was never very good at the 10 pin. The balls were too heavy for a kid. Yeah, I think those balls are heavy. Yeah. Candle pin really was great for kids because we could we could throw them between our legs, you know? Mm -hmm. You get out there and just throw, try not to lob the ball. <laughs> you know, a lot of people say candle pin is great for kids and old people. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, actually, maybe that's an idea for, well, so the chill zone, do you have to be young uh, to use that? Uh, so, because we could have an event, you know, for the historical society uh, at the chill zone. So. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the Go seniors ahead, are all also, this is, I'm sorry. Seniors are also allowed to bowl. The, the, the COA, Council on Aging, has um, time over at the chill zone too. So they do it during the day. Oh, okay. Yeah. So do we contact the recreation <laughs> department? Uh... Well, um, recreation department or the COA, it depends, but it's administered by the rec department. But right now the, um, the dual language school is over there. So like the roller skating and all kinds of other activities there, but the roller skating rink right now is being used for the um, school. 
Mm. Yeah, but the bowling is still available. <clears throat> that's, is that's great. Susan, are you familiar with Sammy White's bowling yeah, alley? There? I never bowled there, but actually I live quite close to there. Because they were both 10 pin and candle pin, weren't they? Um, they might have been. I'm not positive, but um, they were definitely one of the um, locations for um, the Channel 5 show. Yeah. I was able, I know this is sort of gruesome, but I was able to get some pictures, some neutral pictures, um, from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office um, to include in my book because, you know, that was the site of those murders back Oh, in that's the right. That's right. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. So, yeah, of course... I I think people used to go there for dates, but I think it had somewhat of a seedy reputation. I don't know. You know, it's funny. I live in Brighton. So um, when I talk to some of my neighbors who grew up here, they always, they said they walked over to Sammy White's or they went there after school and no one seemed to think it had a seedy reputation. So I don't know. <laughs> These are kids who grew up there. <laughs> I met my wife there. So I have to say it wasn't seedy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's, I, when Marie mentioned uh, middle school on Lexington Street, I went to that middle school when, when it was Kennedy. And once a month, they had a half day on a Wednesday. They called it curriculum day, where I think the teachers had their meetings in the second half of the day. But it was our tradition to walk over to the, to the Wallex after school on that day. We'd all get permission to not take the buses home. And I have memories of when school would let out, it would just be a sea of children running towards the Wallex. <laughs> and I think back now at the, the staff must have been, oh, but here they come. Yep. <laughs> we would all just flood into the place. We had the, you know, great times then. And so they, sold, they sold candy bars there. Cause I always remember that uh, I went uh, and purchased, uh, my favorite was the Sky Bar um, there. So it was part of the whole Wallex experience. Yep, we had the candy machines and all kinds of fun things to do. And I, I don't know if uh, anyone else can see the chat. We did have a couple comments. Um, Susan said, another Susan said, thank you, Susan, very interesting. I went and my mom was on a team and I even had her own bowling ball, just yeah. like my grandmother. Uh, Andy said, uh, very enjoyable presentation. I remember watching it on television. I grew up in Dedham, but I've lived in Michigan many years, and your program brought back <laughs> memories. Mm -hmm. I never really bowled. Uh, Regina says, so nostalgic. I was not allowed to go off into the Wallex, but treasured those times I did. Really enjoyed seeing the chill zone bowling area. Waltham youth are lucky to have a mayor who provided it. I still love to bowl, and thank you for this unique presentation. And uh, Andy reinforced that it was the Riverside Club in the photos uh, from the Watch Factory days there. And uh, we have one more from Susan says, I bowled at Sammy White for gym class, 10 pin, and it wasn't <laughs> CD then. <laughs> well, maybe people are thinking it was CD because of the crime. Right. Yeah. And and the crime was there was um, for people who don't know, it was it was very, very, very upsetting crime. It was a um, I think it was quadruple murder. It was four employees here. Um, it was in 1980 and four employees were were killed. Presumably it was a robbery gone, you know, gone bad in some way. Oh, and they didn't was catch the guy. He was a former employee. You know, we, we mentioned, uh, the, the mayor mentioned the length of the, the alleys at uh, the chill zone. And someone just um, asked, how long is an alley? Is there, there, there must be a standard length. Is that correct? Yeah, I think they're 60 feet. 60 feet. Okay. And <laughs> they're about 42, 41, 42 inches wide. Those gutters can seem really big sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is Jackie Bodwin. I, I remember bowling there. I, I learned to bowl there. And then as I got older, I 
bowled in a lot of the state tournaments, the women's state tournaments. And once I filled in for the women's professional team, Oh. But I, I got killed when I did that, but <laughs> I had a lot of fun. And my son, who's 33 now, was there. He was in high school when the, the lanes closed. I believe it was high school. And the, his team, a lot of the Wallex boys went to Woburn after that. And they insisted the first year of Woburn of being called the Wallex at Woburn. <laughs> so, so he has a jacket that says Wallex at Woburn, and they were the state champions that year. And that oh, that's was great. Finale, so. Oh, that's good history. Yeah. Yeah, Woburn has been owned by the same family for, for a long time now. Was it Tom Bergeron that did the candle bins for cash? It was, um, no, it was... Um, I have to look it up because the name has escaped. Bob Gamir? Yeah. Bob, Bob Gamir. Yeah. And yeah. then I think Rico Petroselli did it for a while. Serious? I think so. But Bob mm. Gamir was the main guy. Mm. Yeah, Marie, I have the same memory of at some point my grandmother watched a bowling show on Saturdays with Tom Bergeron, too. Yeah. And it just may not have been candle bins for cash. Yeah. Right. Yeah, my there, brother, were, there were like dozens of shows. Time. Yeah, Saturday mornings when, in my childhood, when the Saturday morning cartoons ended, the bowling shows started. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my grandmother taking over. It was her turn for the TV after Saturday morning cartoons ended. It was bowling all afternoon. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were a lot of shows. I mean, Candle Pins for Cash was, I mean, Candle Pin Bowling was the first one and the longest running one and probably the most prestigious one. Mm. But there were tons, they were on cable, they were on, you know, those were the days when there was what, UHF channels mm -hmm. or whatever, <laughs> yeah. And um, everywhere in Maine had some and New Hampshire had some and, you know, there, there were a lot of shows. My brother worked uh, for many, many years uh, for Gerald Ash, um, which became part of Thermo Electron later on. Um, and they, so a lot of the companies in Waltham had bowling teams and there were bowling leagues that these teams played in also. So it was very big as an employee uh, activity uh, for companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and you know, what was interesting is as, as factories started closing or moving out of state, that was sort of when bowling start, bowling participation started going down because mm -hmm. the leagues were disappearing and, mm -hmm. and the bowling alleys were starting to see that change. And, and now a lot of the leagues are just, you know, they're individual members. They're not sponsored by, by a company or anything anymore. Right. Um, we had a, a question come in asking why the original uh, candle pin creators uh, didn't just out a bowling alley with the pins that already were being used. Did the candle pin, it came after 10 pin, correct? You know, there was, a. I don't know the exact chronology, but there was a lot of experimentation going on right around that time. Bowling, I think originally in this country is believed to have evolved from the German game of ke ke kegling or something, um, or, you know, Rip Van Winkle and the Dutch settlers and lawn bowling. And there was, there was a lot of stuff going on. So I think at the beginning, nothing was standardized. The pins weren't standardized. The balls weren't standardized. Um, at these um, billiards places that often had bowling, I think customers could say, you know, I want these pins or these pins or this ball or that ball or... So it, it, there was just a lot going on. And honestly, I think that story about the broomsticks and I, I sometimes wonder if it's true, but <clears throat> I'm not supposed to say that. So <laughs> <laughs> it has been presented as the true story of candle pin bowling, but I don't know how anyone could know. So well, I've seen, uh, I've actually watched or seen uh, lawn bowling in Northern Ireland. 
And it's quite a bit different from American Bossy concept Bossy. of bowling. They yeah. get all dressed up for it. The men wear suit jackets. Uh, sometimes they wear kilts with the suit jackets also, but the women all get dressed up. And mm -hmm. from looking at them, it looks like they, uh, they were some of the more conservative people in the, mm. the uh, community that were doing this. So it had some sort of a sociological, you know, uh, aspect to it um, that, uh, like in Northern Ireland, I don't think a lot of Catholics did lawn bowling. I think it, it was primarily among the Protestant community there. So uh, whereas American bowling is, uh, was obviously a very democratic sport. But what's interesting about American bowling is that beginning, I think it did have that that sort of disreputable reputation because a lot of times it was played in billiard halls mm. and there was gambling going on and smoking and drinking and you know and and it was and and I think it was it it took years for bowling to become this sort of you know wholesome family entertainment. And of course, in the beginning of the game, women weren't allowed to bowl. Mm. And they didn't start bowling till, I don't know, maybe the ninth, the, the 19 teens, maybe. Mm. Well, does anybody remember the pool hall that was next to the bridge on Moody Street on, on the north side of the river? Um, that was considered to be very seedy. I remember um, Sally Calora told me one time that her her father used to say that people went in there and never came out. <laughs> I I never made the connection until tonight that so many of the bowling alleys had the gorgeous neon signs. You know, I re I remember your presentation from a few years ago on all the neon signs and you know, it just never really clicked. And it just sort of made me wonder if anybody knows what happened to the Wallach sign. Yeah, I was thinking that too. <laughs> Does anybody, I mean, I'm sure it was probably too big to save, but I shouldn't say that because I've seen some of the signs in our collection and mm -hmm. the historical society, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody yes. know what happened to the, the big, the Wallach signs? I, you you wonder whether someone at the Waltham Museum might know about that. So, because um, the randos, you know, um, one of the randos was, uh, you know, associated with Al Arena and did a lot of things. So, so if they were going to give anything from the Wallex to someone, they would, you know, give it probably to the uh, Waltham Museum. I don't know of anything like the neon, but I do know that uh, there are some Wallach's artifacts of candle pins and, bo and bowling balls at the Waltham Museum. Also, um, Rita Tortola Calora is, you know, many of the second generation are still alive. Her brother, uh, Butch, um, you know, Fred Jr. has passed, but um, I can ask them that. Now, when uh, Donna Leswell was doing the artwork for the Chill Zone, the Wallach sign actually had sparkles in it. So she basically put in the skate and scoop sparkles. So you can actually see mm. what, what it looked like. So, but I will ask the family um, because they um, were very pleased with the um, historical um, information. They provided me a lot of pictures that are actually in the, um, Bowling, I mean, the uh, skate and scoot area, you know, the roller skating area. So, um, and there is uh, two, you know, whole walls of um, family pictures as well as um, family history. So I can ask Rita about that. We, we took a couple of pictures of those that you mentioned, Mayor, but the reflection on the glass made them almost impossible to, to show. But if, you, if anyone has a chance to go up and, and see them, the collection is, is beautiful. It's going so just, to great. Just so you know, John Rando Jr., I mean, um, John Rando Jr., John Rando, not Jr., um, he his mother gave him the money to do this, only if he brought his sisters into the mm. business. So, but they um, they actually worked the farms. The, the, you know, the house was moved from um, Lexington Street and 
So they have a tremendous history. And um, the last to die was Christine Russo, Randall Russo. And uh, her, her daughter is still alive. There's a lot of pictures of Donna, Donna Hayes. And um, they very much um, appreciate the fact that the Wallach's history has been preserved. And I appreciate that you all have your own collections too. So um, I think it's important you know, because when they started this, um, I believe Mr. Genova's um, father said to them, they were gonna build a, um, like a car, automobile, um, truck repair. And uh, he said, you should build a recreation center for kids. And so that's how it started. So, but we've been re very lucky that of their contribution. Um, these things with the advent of video games and everything, they did, you know, as Rachel said, they did compete with that for a little bit, but there was just too much going on. And as well as the maintenance of it became very difficult because it was getting old. And so um, Bill Calora, who was one of the um, son-in-laws, he um, ran it with Fred uh, Tortola Jr. So, but they closed it, you know, they were sad to close it, but it, they just couldn't continue with the maintenance of it. And, and there's a big liability. The insurance policy for all these things uh, mm -hmm. is tremendous. Plus, you know, getting people to work. And But they tried the best with the birthday parties and everything else. But for those kids that you mentioned Wallachs, you know, you know what it means. What year did it close, Mia McCarthy? Oh, 2003, maybe. I don't, that I can't off the top of my head um, remember. I think 2002. Yep. Yeah. So, um, but, um, you know, later, later they consolidate the, the ownership, you know, a lot of them were um, transferred to the, so Mr. Tortola in the end had most of the uh, control of the property and businesses. Well, one of the things that you want to do if you have the opportunity is pick up uh, one of uh, Sue Bregman's books. Uh, Sue, you want to talk about where they're available, where you, people might be able to pick them up? <laughs> sure. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can do it. One is, of course, you can buy it directly from me on my website, and that is rednickel.com, red like the color, nickel like the coin.com. And, you, and then if you buy it from me, I will happily sign the book for you. Um, and if you don't want to do that for, or you, you know, you can also get it pretty much wherever books are sold. I haven't been out to many bookstores lately, but um, I think the local bookstores probably have it. Certainly, you know, Amazon and um, Barnes and Noble have it oh, also, I think. Her book, what does someone can't open both? Oh. And uh, there are other, other places like that. Um, I think there's a website where you can order it from independent bookstores as well. I forget that address. It might be something like bookstore.org <laughs> or something. Um, so yeah, so rednickel.com is my website and you can, you can get it there. Also, um, Wayne mentioned that I'm working on a new book. It's not done yet. It's basically, it's barely been started. But it's going to be looking at some of the attractions along Route 1, pretty much from the Canadian border down to down through Massachusetts. So Maine, New Hampshire and, and uh, Massachusetts. So that's going to be fun. And there's certainly a number of kennel pin bowling alleys along that route that I'll be able to include, including the Big 20, which I talked about tonight, and Portsmouth Bowlerama. Well, I want to thank you very much for this tonight, Susan. It's uh, really thank appreciated. You. Mayor McCarthy, thank you again as, as, as well. Uh, this has been a, a lot of fun. It's been mm -hmm. something that people keep mentioning how it brings back memories, and it sure does for a lot of us in a, uh, in a, who've been around Waltham and been around bowling for a long time. So uh, again, uh, Rachel and I will be here until people want to go home and uh, you're more than welcome to continue the conversation. But uh, just so that people can say they heard it all, you're more than welcome to uh, uh, log off at any time. And thank you for coming, appreciate it. Well, 